Meine Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen zu unserer zweiten Runde. Wir haben im ersten Auftaktpanel die große Frage aus nationaler Perspektive, aus deutscher Perspektive betrachtet. Es war ein wenig eine äh, deutsche Introspektion auch äh, mit den Stichworten lahme Ente, äh, multilateraler Aktivist. Und wir wollen jetzt die Debatte internationalisieren. Und äh, ich freue mich sehr, dass wir für diese Debatte drei Gäste, jeweils aus Kanada, Brasilien und Frankreich gewinnen konnten, die uns ähm, die Multilateralismusdebatte aus internationaler Perspektive nahe bringen, in erster Linie auch wichtig, wichtige Impulse geben, was für den nichtdeutschen Kontext äh, Prioritäten sind in der neuen Multilateralismusdebatte, äh, welche Vorstellungen damit einhergehen und insbesondere äh, welche Erwartungen an Deutschland herangetragen werden, wenn von einer Allianz für den Multilateralismus die Rede ist. Ich freue mich sehr, dass wir für diese Debatte Michael Thumann als Moderator gewinnen konnten, äh, den ich Ihnen kurz vorstelle. Die meisten von Ihnen als gebildete Zeitleserinnen und Leser kennen ihn bereits. Michael Thumann ist ähm, der ähm, diplomatische Korrespondent der Zeit. Er leitete sowohl das Moskau- als auch das Istanbul-Büro der Zeit. Seine journalistischen Schwerpunkte sind neben der deutschen Außenpolitik der Mittlere Osten, die Türkei sowie Russland. Und ähm, vielen von Ihnen sind wahrscheinlich seine zahlreichen Artikel zur Krim-Krise geläufig. Eine Krise, die er von 2014 bis 2015 in der Zeit umfassend behandelt hat. Herr Thumann, Sie haben das Wort. Und vielleicht äh, eine Ankündigung, diese Debatte wird hauptsächlich in Englisch stattfinden. Wer äh, Übersetzungshilfen braucht, kann sich an unser Personal äh, wenden und ähm, kriegt dann die entsprechenden Kopfhörer. Bitte sehr, Herr Thumann. Dankeschön. Ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich zu unserer heutigen Frühabenddiskussion und dem letzten Programmpunkt äh, von, von heute nach dem wunderbaren Panel von heute Nachmittag wollen wir einige Aspekte, den Blick auf einige Aspekte noch, noch etwas schärfen und gleichzeitig natürlich die Perspektive dehnen über Europa hinaus. Ähm, wir werden, Herr Franceschini hat es eben schon angedeutet, wir äh, werden auf dem Panel Englisch sprechen. Ähm, Sie haben alle Kopfhörer, nehme ich an, wenn Sie, wenn Sie Kopfhörer haben möchten. Manchmal hilft das ja auch aus rein akustischen Gründen, besser zu verstehen. Und selbstverständlich können die Fragen, wie immer Sie wollen, auf Englisch oder auf Deutsch gestellt werden. Und ich selbst werde jetzt auf, auf Englisch wechseln, damit wir uns hier auf dem Podium direkt untereinander unterhalten. Multilateralism, multilateralism is under attack. And uh, it is notably the three strongest uh, military powers um, and uh, three P5 members of the Security Council, U the US, uh, Russia, and China, which have leaders who prefer unilateral actions and bilateral deals over multilateral procedures as they have illustrated in the past years on numerous accounts. Um, from a European perspective, this is a frightening sight. And uh, there is um, uh, an advisor to the uh, former EU Foreign Policy High Commissioner. Uh, the advisor's name is Natalie Tocci. She recently wrote that uh, both the future of uh, international organizations uh, are at stake, is at stake. And she has, and I quote her here, um, she said that the EU will struggle to survive in a transactional world which, in which unilateralism and bilateralism are the norm. Um, she called to defend multilateral, uh, the ma multilateral order on all fronts and, and added, we cannot afford to fail. So this is the dramatic setting in which we are to discuss the future of multilateralism tonight. 
and ask what is to be done to defend multilateralism, how to possibly forge an alliance for multilateralism and explore the pace for multilateral action in today's international relations. We have on our panel three distinguished guests which seem to be best suited to discuss this. And I start to my left with uh, Isabella Teixeira. She is the co-chair of the International Resource Panel with the UN Environment Program, also a member of the UN High-Level Advisory Board on Economy and Social Affairs. And between 2010 and 16, she was the Minister of Environment of Brazil. To my right, Stefan Dion. He is Canada's ambassador to Germany and the special envoy to uh, both the EU and Europe. Um, between 2015 and 17, he was the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada. And again to my left, uh, Manuel Lafont Rapnoui is the director of uh, the Center for Analysis, Planning and Strategy in the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, he has worked uh, intensively on multilateral affairs before. Um, and uh, he, as, as when he di directed also the Division for Political Affairs at the Department for the UN at the French Foreign Ministry. Um, so to, to start with, I think it, is, it, it, it makes very much sense to um, uh, take the point of view of those who think they are, uh, they, they, they will actually design the future of international relations. Um, the doomsday sayers um, and those who triumphantly say that predict the collapse of multilateralism, multilateral organizations. And of course, point to the US uh, government, uh, which has done a lot to undermine the WTO, for example, um, at times also NATO uh, takes action against uh, EU procedures and uh, has uh, also played an obstructive role in the United Nations. Um, so, and here would be, my, uh, Mrs. Uh, Isabella, here would be my, my first question. Um, are we back in a world of bilateralism the unilateral action and bilateral deals. Uh, okay, first of all, uh, good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me to come. I just arrived from Brazil, so sorry, uh, because I'm completely low bat, but I'll do my best. <laughs> okay, <laughs> after 12 hours traveling and without plant a tree, uh, don't tell Greta, please. I want to be back in Brazil, you plant my tree to neutralize my footprint, okay? But uh, I think that you have a really good point considering uh, the, also what I, I was here uh, uh, learning in the first section. When you talk about multilateralism, I'm from an emerging economy. I'm from a developing country. And Brazil used to be a strategic player in multilateralism. So uh, I, I will ask you, I don't, I'm not comment what is happening today in Brazil, because I hope that you can change this. But we still are a strategic player in multilateralism. And also, we still are uh, a strategic player in bilateral cooperation, and also in the regional cooperation, considered BRICS, BASIC group, considered G20 uh, group, etc., etc. We have the new dynamics. You need to understand what's happened today, because it is based on the needs and how we can connect and bring new narratives to make sense in short-term and mid-term perspectives. And uh, for a developing country or emerging economy, uh, it's very important to understand how a country like Brazil can use this to be part or to have a strategic role in new econ global economy. Okay, and we need to understand because the countries, the developed countries, they are looking for, for additional insertion into the global economy. And so the international relation means that we're looking forward to address this. And uh, it's not only the multilateralism, but also, as you mentioned, uh, the bilateral ones. And I can give some examples for very fast when uh, we discuss China, okay? China and Brazil has a traditional cooperation for the last 30 years, okay? Bilateral one. Huawei, it's in Brazil in the last 30 years. Okay? And you have a traditional cooperation with Germany since the 60s, more than 30 years. 
So I think that uh, we need to understand how the international dialogue is looking for to address critical problems. The global problems, the global issues, they are so complex. And of course, nobody alone will address solution to this. But we need also to understand what are the, the requirements to manage this, to avoid that, this is my first point here, that new alliance based on multilateralism that must be strengthened, not be confused or be, uh, have the mistake of understanding that means a new protectionism for some countries, or have some bilateral arrangements to means protectionism. So I think that uh, we are not have a back and sliding. We have this transition to the end of the world. Uh, we need to understand that the requirements, the political requirements are really, really high, diverse, diverse. And also, we need to understand that the narrative that we used to have in the 90s, based on global issues like sustainability, human, human rights, gender, cities, population growth, this narrative, it was a legacy. It were, ne were, were a legacy from the 90s for the new, the new century and under the multilateralism umbrella. And what you have in 2001 is not one September 11. You have China in the board on WTO. And this changed the world, OK? And we need to understand the impact and how we have emerging economy manage this. And my feeling is that uh, we need to bring new players into the room, to have a new political rooms to address, based on dialogue, how we can stress multilateralism based on alliance, coalitions, partnerships, but understand that development economy they have needs and not only common or mutual uh, interests. And this makes sense in politics when you take decisions to short term perspectives. It's true because the trade offs, they put pressure, for example, on environmental assets. So, my first point is this, and I can, of course, of course explore better uh, along the discussion. So basically, you are saying no backsliding there. Um, into I hope. A, and um, but Manuel Rapnoy, do you see it the same uh, way, or um, when, uh, or, or do you do you rather have a pessimistic view, uh, as as uh, the those say the doomsday say as say we we are back in this this horrible world of, of bilateralism. The first thing is I, I don't want to oppose multilateralism that would be good and bilateralism that would be bad. Mm. Yes. Uh, and even unilateralism is actually part of international relations and some international law uh, uh, prescribes unilateral mm -hmm. acts by states. The, the, the issue is how do you combine them? And clearly, if you have just unilateralism and bilateralism and no multilateralism, we have an imbalance, and that imbalance uh, is uh, problematic. Um, there's often an, uh, an other uh, uh, opposition which I think is not helpful, which is people who oppose inform informal multilateralism or ad hoc collective actions and institutional, universal, more inclusive, uh, more perennial formats. And I think the, the right way to go, the right way to do things, is to combine both. It's, it's obvious that if you, want, uh, if you wanted COP21 on, on climate to succeed, you couldn't just have the UN format with 193 countries. You needed that format, and you also needed a lot of more informal, more ad hoc, smaller formats. And the question was, how do you feed into the gl more institutional... So I, I don't want to oppose the two, that's the first point. But I still believe, without wanting to be pessimistic on the fact that this is gone forever, that yes, there is a crisis of multilateralism, and I think it's a mistake in perspective if you think that this is just about uh, the current US administration policy. There's a lack of appetite for international cooperation, which actually is a lack of appetite for the kind of discipline that uh, international cooperation uh, carries. And that lack of appetite exists, including within our publics. If you think of the way some uh, public uh, uh, opinions, some societies in Europe reacted to the global compact in Marrakesh on migration, that was a kind of resentment against the idea that things would be imposed by a technocratic, diplomatic uh, uh, process, multilateral process that would attempt uh, that would be an attempt to national sovereignty. So you have this issue, which is not just some governments, but which resonates within some parts of the public. 
There's also uh, geostrategic, geopolitical efforts by some powers to block or even to hollow out uh, international cooperation and multilateral organization. So obviously everybody can think of the veto at the UN Security Council, but if you look more precisely, actually there are a lot of these attempts Blocking nominations of judges to the appellate body of the World Trade Organization is one way to hollow out the, the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO. Um, uh, challenging the uh, work by the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, is a way to deprive the diplomatic process of the basis that we need to start a negotiation, which is agreed facts. And there's a third phenomenon, which is some countries actually are not against multilateralism. They just have a different vision, a different plan for multilateralism. And what we see with the Chinese uh, investments in the UN uh, system, but also uh, uh, in parallel with the uh, UN system, with other kind of organizations that they are setting up or that they are joining, is a different vision of multilateralism from the one that was embodied, I would argue, by uh, uh, the UN Charter in uh, 1945. So you have these, I would say, three major challenges, and, and they all have taken a new level, a new degree uh, recently. Thank you. Yes, you, uh, I think, rightly pointed out that there's a lack of appetite uh, for multilateral actions in, in many societies, and there's an uh, <clears throat> increasingly critical view. Uh, would you also, uh, Stéphane Dion, would you say that uh, this is also the case in, in Canada? And, um, and how far Canada as a neighbor of the United States, which is promoting um, bilateral relations uh, with this administration very strongly, and on the other hand, uh, a government which is dedicated to multilateral action. How does your country maneuver in this precarious situation? Thank you, Herr Tuman. Vielen Dank für die Einladung. Entschuldigung, dass ich heute Abend auf Englisch statt Deutsch spreche. Mein <laughs> Deutsch ist immer noch ein Work in Progress. We appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to, to say that I failed to remember a golden age of multilateralism. When we speak about the crisis, it means that in the past it was easy. In the past, uh, this balance we are trying to find between national state system, sovereignty of nations is the basic of our system, and the effort we are doing to bring them together to work uh, for common good, which is definition of multilateralism, which is uh, cooperation between states in accordance with international standards. These standards are uh, codified in legal texts, uh, treaties, um, convention, agreements, charters, and institutionalized in a panoply of international organizations more developed than ever, as we speak, and covering all the activities of humankind. And these institutions, most of them work quite well, and they are telling us what to do, but we don't listen. I will give you an example. We'll not be able to solve a problem with the planet, the divorce in which we are, if we don't listen to these international organizations, for example, on climate change, uh, if we don't have a world carbon tax, we'll not do it. And the international organizations are telling us that unanimously, uh, the uh, U UN uh, uh, Program for the Environment, uh, the, uh, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, the International Energy Agency, and so on and so on create a world carbon tax. And they gave us a forum where we may negotiate that. It's the Article 6 of the agreement, of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. But if you, live, you follow these negotiations, it's pathetic. We're unable to agree. Uh, we failed to find a solution to have a world ca uh, carbon price. We have, in fact, the vast majority of our emissions that are free of any cost as we speak. So to me, to speak about a crisis of multilateralism, it's more a crisis of humankind with its relationship with the planet. And we need to take care of that 
We need to develop this appetite. We need to use the instruments we have built. And I'm pleased to come from a country that has been quite strong to build these institutions. We need to improve them. And I see that despite the, some declarations of some politicians, they survive quite well. Uh, the WTO, yes, there is a difficulty, a difficulty with the, uh, uh, the appellate body. Uh, but otherwise, the US are still there. They work hard in it. They are part of the panels, uh, and they are very good experts that are helping the WTO to work. And NATO, that we like NATO or not, Canada is pleased to be part of NATO. NATO has more money than ever, more members than ever, and more US troops on, on uh, European soil than some years ago. So I'm not saying these institutions are, are in good shape always. We need to take care of, of them. It's why Canada applied to have an alliance of multilateralism to work on it. But our problems are not multilateralism. Our problems is that we are not doing what these institutions are telling us to do. I think there we have a... We, we already got to, to the, the um, heart of the matter in, a, in, in this, this very crucial central question of um, you um, uh, called it the, the crisis in the relationship between um, man and nature. Um, and it is, it is indeed the big question, um, how do we fight against the man-made causes of climate change um, if, um, if multi, uh, multilateral organizations are being undermined? So, um, and here I come to what, what you have just mentioned, that in fact, yes, there are, we have a, a reality of both bilateral relations, unilateral action, and uh, multilateral relations. But um, how to maneuver between these different trends when actually you are faced with such a gigantic challenge, how to resolve uh, the, the, the issues before us uh, con concerning climate change um, if we partly um, slide back into, or if we partly work by, in bilateral ways and uh, in multilateral ways. And can we resolve at all um, in bilateral ways challenges of climate change? Okay, um, as you know, I was on the, one of the key negotiators of Paris Agreement. And uh, I remember that we started this debate uh, in 2011, after 2009 Copenhagen COP that was uh, failed, and also in Cancun 2010, when you have KP2 out of the game, because developed economies took the decision to be out of the game. Okay? And we arrived in, in Durban conference in 2011, looking forward to draft solutions and try what we do. And they'll tell a story here, if you allow me. Uh, this is private, but of course, it's the internet, no, it's not private. Uh, <laughs> there is no off. Um, I remember that I arrived at uh, Durban, and you have a basic meeting. Uh, Brazil, South Africa, India, and China, a regional group, exactly discussing the strategy that we assume of emerging economy to manage Durban conference. After this, uh, uh, you have, during the lunch, a bilateral meeting with the Chinese delegation. And after this meeting, uh, with a brown bag lunch, I sat on the bench, together with two ambassadors, I called to my president. And uh, because of the time zone, she was sleeping. And, uh, and uh, we took decision to change Brazil position. And uh, I was in the afternoon the first speaker on the plenary for the opening session ministerial, ministerial conference. And I, I assume that Brazil uh, will propose to have a new global agreement based on two things. When FTCC must be preserved as a climate regime, but all the countries must be on board to bring the solution. And this means that uh, I remember that everybody stand up and clap their hands, and the European the Commission on Climate Change start, uh, hello, what's happened here? Let's do, let's do it. 
But this is something that happens when you have a sign or have a common, clear understanding what the bilateral interest between Brazil and China, and also the regional interest on Asian economy. And Brazil took the leadership allowed for these countries. Okay, this is one story. The another one, as you mentioned, uh, how we can manage this. Okay, uh, when you talk about how we can uh, tackle climate change, it's very important to consider not only the historical emissions that we have since Industrial Revolution, but this part of the carbon is still there, and also in this century you have emerging economies' role. Okay, you have, of course, China and the United States to get the good example. They are responsible for 45% of the global emissions, CO2 emissions. And Brazil is a country that uh, historically you have 3% of the global emissions, but we are a part of 10 countries that is, are responsible for emissions based on deforestation. And, all the, and this is something tricky that people must understand, because deforestation in Amazonia is around 9% of this, it's based on, on illegal activities. So it's crime. It's an environmental crime, okay? It's not economic activity. It's not based on agriculture or industry or energy. This is crime. But the other side of the coin, you have energy, and our energy mix on renewable energy, energy mix, okay? It's around 30, 43, 45% of renewable energy. The average, the global average is 14, okay? So we can take decision, and also we have our land use based on agriculture, that to have all the technologies available to manage better low carbon agriculture. We can do this. And Brazil, 40 years ago, used to import food. And today, we are one of the most important food producers around the world, and has supposed to have a strategic role to achieve food security in the next years the global food security. What, what makes sense for the multilateralists? The past, or indeed what happened? For example, what is the narrative that I need today for the future? What are the next 40 years of agriculture, Brazilian agriculture? What will be the delivery of Brazilian agriculture for the next 40 years? Not for the last 40 years. Okay, that we have a powerful agriculture that is responsible to preserve around 6% of nature vegetation. But I would like to know what will be the deliver in the next 40 years. This is the contradiction, this is a good example that we have today when we discuss ambition on climate change. Because if you're not able to consider Paris Agreement implementation, because we start implementing this, I hope so, <laughs> okay, soon, but to cut emissions, we need to bring the players into the room that are responsible to take decision to cut emissions, not only the ministers for the environment. So the political constituency that you need to Paris implementation, bring together bilateral cooperation, the interests that share in economic activities. As you mentioned, Article 6 and carbon price and carbon market. And also, as you mentioned, how we can strengthen everything, how we can bring people international, under the international cooperation to make sense, to manage better, accomplish global issues like climate change. So we need to understand what are the interests that to put pressure on to highlight trade-offs or to have a blur like deforestation that is not based on legal economic activities. This is based on legal. So it doesn't make sense for me as a former minister, the lowest rate of deforestation in Amazonia to us during my term as a minister. It doesn't make sense for me that to have Brazilians today come internationally to say that the world own $30 billion for Brazil. Nobody knows that. Because Brazil, it's a moral imperative to tackle deforestation because it's a legality, it's a crime. But to own Brazil, nobody owns, but you need to understand what the challenge that can make, come Brazil, bring Brazil on board to play strategically and to have shortcuts for low carbon agriculture. And this means, my last comment, that we need to avoid, so I agree, the backsliding that probably you we have today in Brazil, exactly to dialogue with the last century, not with the future. So good stories to say how indeed you can bring things together, how it's important to dialogue, how it's important to bring new agendas or new common interests to make sense and have strategies and bring new leadership for implementing Paris Agreement.
for the implementation of Paris Agreement. Here, here we, I think we come to an important point how to actually get influence in, in, uh, in, in, in this framework of, of uh, fighting man-made climate change. And um, there was, uh, Manuel Rapnui, if I may ask you, there was an interesting approach of uh, the French president mm -hmm. last year when uh, uh, he uh, addressed the problems in Brazil and its uh, uh, current president. Um, and when, when he spoke out against finalizing the planned trade agreement between the EU and uh, the Mercosur, um, the trade agreement now has, uh, has had come to a halt, uh, specifically now in January by the intervention of Austria, of course, but, but still the French president, he made that an issue and he made the, um, uh, the, 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 the problems in Brazil, he made it an issue and uh, called for not concluding this agreement. So if I, uh, if I may say so, he basically called to derail a multilateral agreement promoting multilateralism as a response to a unilateral action. Um, so for the sake of multilateralism, how, how can we get ahead and how can we actually influence from the outside uh, actors who embark on these very, on, 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 on damaging uh, unilateral actions. So that, that's exactly the reason why uh, uh, with Germany we've pushed for this alliance for multilateralism. <clears throat> I've, I've uh, uh, set out the three major challenges uh, uh, for, for the multilateral system and I think one of the consequences of these, uh, uh, these three challenges is that there's a lot of countries out there who watch this and say why actually would I play, by, play that game? Uh, because that game is risky. Uh, I risk to uh, put constraint on myself that others will not abide uh, for. Uh, I will uh, uh, take uh, costs uh, that others will not support. I will uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, you have this uh, prisoner dilemma. Uh, I will lose a prisoner dilemma because I will be cooperative and, uh, and others will take advantage of that. So I will sit on the fence and watch what is happening. And the Alliance for Multilateralism in some way is uh, creating the opposite dynamic, uh, keeping the momentum for cooperation, telling those who want to cooperate and play by the rules that, of course, uh, one major country, not just one country, one major country uh, left the Paris uh, uh, deal on climate, mm -hmm. but the rest of the deal is still there. And the rest of the countries of the world are, are still there. And so what is important is that we focus not on the risk uh, uh, that this uh, happened and the domino effect that could have been. I think when that would have happened, we could have had a, a show of hands to say, uh, is the Paris going, uh, deal going to resist or not? Quite a few people uh, thought that it, there would be this kind of domino effect. It didn't happen. So we need to continue working together to implement it. And we need to continue to work together to keep that open for the time when hopefully the US uh, uh, will come back. So that, that's one, uh, one part of the, of the uh, uh, response. It's the Alliance for Multilateralism or other events, other initiatives, etc., are there to, ex to, to show that there is momentum and it's actually still a, a good idea. The other problem is a bit more complex. Um, and it was alluded to in the, uh, in the uh, uh, opening of the conference today. Uh, we used to believe, especially I think we Europeans, that uh, interdependence was good because it would force us into cooperation. If you have interdependence where well, you have these challenges that you can only tackle jointly, so you will have to do it. And we are now in a world where we see that not only that does not happen, it, it, there's no mechanical effect. That should be the case, but it still is not the case. And we've been interdependent very clearly and vividly for quite some time now, and it's still not the case. But on the contrary, you have some powers who, uses, uh, who use uh, interdependence as a weapon and who leverage it in a much more balance of power, geopolitical, geostrategic approach to things. And so the key question for us Europeans or multilateralists is, 
What consequences do we draw from that? Do we think that actually interdependence is the problem and we get back to more nationalistic, uh, sovereignist, uh, uh, closed approach to these issues, unilateral, etc.? Or do we understand that this is very complex, very ambiguous, make the case for our public? I'm getting back to this public attitudes issue because I think it's key, especially in democracies, obviously. Uh, and understand how we can, at the same time, shield ourselves from this weaponization of interdependence. And for instance, in Europe, this is all the discussion about European sovereignty. And yet understand how European sovereignty doesn't mean an abandonment of multilateralism, of uh, rules-based world order, of international cooperation, but on, on the contrary is the other side of the coin. C can I check just one quick example on, on digital? Um, uh, Minister Le Drian has been uh, um, very outspoken on, on uh, digital sovereignty, European digital sovereignty uh, recently. Um, and, and there are a number of reasons why, and I think with the debate on 5G you have one example, but there are many others, why there is an issue about how, how do you develop, how do you strengthen sovereignty, and why this can happen only at the European level and not just at, at the national level. But actually, this will happen only, not just if, there's, there, we've, if we have the toolbox for European sovereignty on digital issues, but also if we succeed in building an open, free and secure global governance system for those digital issues. There's no way you can be truly, genuinely, practically sovereign if you don't have a world order, if you don't have a global governance system, that supports this equal sovereignty. The problem with sovereignty uh, uh, and, and unilateralism is it's not sovereignty as such. It's, do you want a world of, of sovereigns where it's actually a, a, a rat race or a my country first approach? Or do you want a world of sovereign, but which is about equal sovereignty between countries? And the only thing that can guarantee equal sovereignty is this global order of a free, open and secure uh, cyberspace. So the two need to go hand in hand, and we need to build these two together. That's my uh, answer to your question. Um, interdependence as a weapon. I, I think Canada has uh, uh, has experienced uh, this this problem in the past three years, uh, numerous instances. Um, so the the challenge at hand is here that. On the one hand, uh, it seems to me Canada was a country and has been a country which tried to defend multilateralism, but on the other hand had to defend itself uh, when being faced by Donald Trump uh, with uh, uh, different ways of using this interdependence. So what, what was the Canadian solution to that? What, what is the Canadian answer to it? And Mr. Sumban, I would like to come back to the point, why are we speaking about the crisis of multilateralism? Because uh, superpowers try to have a zone and influence, and then, but when they did not try to do that, <coughs> and I think we made a lot of progress. I think the, uh, the Cold War was much worse than today. <laughs> speaking about zone and of influence, it was much tougher at that time. Uh, if we speak about crisis of multilateralism, I think we are mistaken. It's what I think. Uh, you speak about Canada and the United States. Of course, the United States is important for us. It's 75% of our trade. The relationship between the two countries are, are, very, are, are very strong. It's the longest border frontier of the world without any military uh, protection. It's a wonderful thing. We should celebrate that. Of course, sometimes we have problems, but I would dream for the world to have a relationship between a big neighbor and a smaller one that is as, as peaceful and effective for the planet than the Canada and the United States. We have a difficulty with the current uh, president of the United States, but you know, <laughs> former presidents were not always easy. Yeah. And, and this one, yes, is more unilateralist, nationalist, um, isolationist than his predecessor, and he make a virtue, he's proud of it, to be unpredictable. So it's difficult to cope with him. But the United States is not only one man, it's a civilization. It's governors, 
it's uh, the Congress, it's uh, scientists, universities, uh, media, uh, people-to-people -people relationship with Canadians. It's a wonderful world. And when it's time to convince the Americans to try to not be uni unilateralist and to be multilateralist, you will say you're the ambassador, but tell me which country better than Canada is able to sometimes have some success, even with President Trump, than Canada. So I do a pitch. I think Canada should be the successor of Germany at the Security Council under the circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we mentioned several times the alliance of, of multilateralists, and uh, actually in Europe uh, we uh, long ha do have this alliance of multilateralists, of course, in, in the EU. Uh, it is uh, perfectly epitomizing such an alliance. The question is, if you look at, a, at the global uh, stage, which which would be the obvious candidates for such a global alliance. Um, and uh, Canada obviously, obviously is, is one country, and, and, and Germany also lately, particularly in, in, in uh, regarding and in the context of the conclusion of the free trade agreement, Japan was mentioned. Um, so if you look at your own country, if you look at Latin America, which would be the candidates and which is, at this point in time, the readiness uh, and uh, the receptiveness for, for such an alliance? I think that Latin America is a key uh, uh, region to play uh, shortcuts to achieve some common objectives that the alliance would like to address. Um, I can give an example, for example, in Amazon region and climate change. You have, Brazil has 65% of Amazon basin, and you have other countries that share this. Uh, can you have a, an innovative way to deal with challenges of regional development, bring together the alliance? Because in Brazilian Amazon, you have 25 million people that live there. It's not 2,000, 2,500. It's 25 million people that live there. It's more than 50% of national territory in Brazil. And multilateralism, it's a precondition to address solutions. Because if we're able to play together, we can play at international level to influence other players like South South Cooperation. And uh, my feeling is that uh, this alliance, and also because we have a long tradition with the region considered the, the cooperation, this alliance can try to move beyond uh, the similar or the like-minded and constantly short-term perspectives and try to understand what is the vision, what, the, what are the responsibilities that we like to share, what are the goals that we like to achieve. And uh, we are a region to have the, probably the most important reserve of natural resource. And uh, you have important assets like Amazonia. It's not only for regional, but the global. Uh, 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 we have a global responsibility that sometimes you have sovereignty as a key issue that comes like a ghost. And uh, what, it, what it means, that you need to discuss sovereignty and defense, security, sovereignty, defense for Amazon region, the basing. We need to discuss human development agenda in that. It's not social inequality, it's not only this, it's human development agenda. The lowest uh, develop, human development indicators or indicators in Brazil, it's in Amazon region. Okay? If you go to the, even for the environmental agenda, we need to understand what would be the impact of disruptive technologies. Amazonia is an isolated region for all the countries. They are not connected, for example, for internet. You have to go into the river, have a boat, and stay there eight hours to try to connect a satellite uh, to access internet. Go out of the capital of the states, you cannot access this. Okay, it's, a, it's something like a, a part of Brazil. Brazil is high connect. It's the second country in the world that we use Facebook, for example. Uh, and so we need to understand what are the requirements that a region like this one, or countries like Latin America have, to be part of an alliance that makes sense to strengthen multilateralism, as he mentioned, that uh, we have in Brazil. It's very interesting, except now that it has Venezuela situation, but the last 100 years, we have all the frontier completely peaceful, more than 100 years, no problems. So how indeed we can bring new 
a, a new agenda, a new approach to address uh, common interests and common values, even with Perio bottlenecks today, unfortunately, short term perspective have. Okay, uh, what, in a what, like what, could, what could prompt the current Brazilian government to, to bring in these assets which you've mentioned into? I think that we need to bring other players, not on the government, like, for example, private sector, not on the private sector, private sector traditional way. What are the new opportunities for regional development? We're talking about, as you mentioned, if you have a, 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 a frontier that we all consolidate with common interests, what are the new common interests? Tell me, you have a new era now. What are the, the unicorns in Amazonia? Without infrastructure? Can you imagine that you can we take a flight and to cross Amazonia, it's around six hours? Okay, only the forest. And have indigenous people who have different cultures, who have different challenges to approach this. So to address multilateralism, as uh, to bring solutions and not to bring other players, we need indeed to understand what are demands, what are the new demands. And it's very interesting that you need to move beyond the forest station, you need to tackle the forest station, you need to go combat the forest station. But indeed, what are the regional development perspectives for not only for Brazil and Amazonia, and but to the other countries. You have illegal mining there, you have illegal logging there, you have traffic, uh, drugs traffic, you have uh, 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 problems with regional crime, and uh, how we can go there and discuss based on what happened in the 90s, during Rio 92, when the international cooperation, do you remember this PPG7 program, that comes from Brazil, that came to Brazil, and share international cooperation values. And what's happened there? We develop a new history uh, with new stories based exactly how to increase regional capacity to deal better with environmental conservation. So you have there, not the hot spots, you have the hope spots, because we have different initiatives that play in the last 30 years with excellent outcomes based on civil society, exactly the measure of a new democracy in Brazil, and today to avoid Amazon exit, uh, to avoid mm -hmm. the, the lack of our democracy, we need to bring additional force, and multilateralism is part of this. Mm -hmm. So we need to bring other players, not only the governments. We need to understand the subnational role, in this, uh, institutional role. You need to understand what is the new market, and even the new generation, the new technology. We have that really transition. If, today you have a transition, but you need to address a transformative. We need a transformation. It's not only the transition. And my feeling that you need to avoid, and multilateralism is good for this, to avoid that transition can means that you can postpone solutions. You cannot postpone solutions. Um, Manuel Rapnu, you've, you've mentioned the vulnerabilities, um, of, for example, in, 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 in the interdependence. And I. I wonder, because multilateral organizations and multilateral actions are, of course, um, more vulnerable um, to actors who would like to destroy, to distract, and uh, uh, to, to go ahead with their own nationalist agenda. The question is, uh, how can could an alliance of multilateralism, how can multilateral organizations, including the EU as a multilateral organization, how can they become more resilient? Um, and could they possibly even uh, react with uh, similar ways of conducting policy? Can, can they do realpolitik at all? Are they able to do so? <clears throat> okay, on, on the resilience, um I, I would argue most of these organizations are pretty resilient already. I mean, UN peacekeeping has survived uh, Srebrenica and Rwanda, uh, which could have been a, a major crisis, just uh, uh, destroying the whole uh, uh, policy in itself. Um, and there are a lot of things to say about how we could still improve a lot uh, UN peacekeeping. But the fact is that after a, a period of crisis and very low resort to deploying blue helmets, etc., UN peacekeeping uh, has proven that it was still um, a very needed responses to uh, the way we can try to manage some of the conflicts uh, uh, in the world. Um, <clears throat> part of the resilience is how also how you modernize the system. 
the, 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 one of the goals of the Alliance for Multilateralism is how you develop uh, uh, multilateral action, multilateral initiatives, uh, uh, coalitions, majority coalitions, to promote uh, new rules, to push for new initiatives, uh, etc. So that's why, for instance, there is this focus on the, on the digital uh, issues. Uh, it was also mentioned uh, earlier. We need, obviously, we need a, a, a law uh, for a war in the cyberspace. Uh, but there is already international humanitarian law. We don't need new rules. I, I personally don't believe we need new rules. We need a political and legal consensus on how these rules that exist, what they mean in, this, in cyberspace. What does self-defense mean in cyberspace? Uh, what does uh, no disproportionate uh, uh, damage uh, uh, means in cyberspace, what protection of civilians mean for cyberspace, etc., etc. But uh, so part of the resilience is also how you modernize uh, the system. And I very much agree with what was said about uh, uh, the multi-stakeholder approach. I think it helps. It helps not just in a situation where it's hard to work with governments, so you work with civil society, waiting for better days or actually preparing and trying to anticipate uh, on uh, better days. Uh, and civil society uh, uh, can be uh, many things, local government, corporation, uh, uh, NGOs, foundations, uh, scientists uh, bringing the expertise uh, that we need. Um, and, and one big initiative that was mentioned earlier already uh, uh, that takes place in France in November every year is the Paris Peace Forum, which exactly is about how to build these kind of multi-stakeholder coalitions in support of multilateralism. But precisely, it's not just uh, uh, as a kind of uh, plan B approach. It, it has to be part of plan A. Uh, and, and it's very important to uh, uh, work on that. I would also uh, like to ask you the, the, the same question about uh, how to enhance resilience of multilateral organizations and uh, also the, the, the question uh, is, is in, in if, if need be another approach possible, um, can multilateral organizations uh, do realpolitik? Uh, I have the, uh, the definition of Minister Mass of the uh, Alliance of uh, uh, Multilateralism, a network of countries coming together in flexible formats to address concrete policy challenges. I think it's welcome, and Canada will be a strong supporter of that, and we, we are part of it since the beginning with France and, and Germany. Uh, but it will not be a new multilateralism. I think we should stop to avoid, to, to think it's, it's the case. Multilateralism is, as I said, cooperation between states according international standards, codified in international law, and uh, institutionalized in, in, in uh, international organizations. And we have, uh, as you said, Manuel, a lot of instruments that are existing today and that we should uh, use. Uh, and we should explain that to our population instead of always saying there is a crisis of multilateralism, how much we owe it to multilateral efforts. If we have been able to decrease poverty the way we did, 43% of human beings in 1990 uh, had, uh, were earning less than $2 a day, 43%. Today is 10%. I wish it would be 0%. Maybe we'll go there one day, if we are working with our multilateral institutions. Uh, we have uh, the crisis of today with the um, uh, coronavirus. 130% died. It's, it's, it's a tragedy. A century ago, it was the Spanish flu. This was not nice for Spain. It did not come from Spain, but the, the wit has been caught. It killed between 50 million and 100 million div ability to compute was not as good as today, uh, 50, between 50 and 100 million people for a world four times less populous than today. It would mean for today about 200 million, between 200 million and 400 million people would die over two years. Even in a country as developed as the United States, the life of expect expectancy decreased by 12 years in two years. They were not equipped at that time as we are today. So we need to develop these instruments and to realize how much they are effective when we use them, ineffective when we ignore them, 
and we, will, we should try always to improve them. It's why we applaud this alliance. But it's something that we have in our hands. For science, the life expectancy in 1950, it was 47 years old. Today, for the world, it's more than 70 years old. We made this progress because we worked together. So I want to take a strong pitch and optimistic one about multilateralism is well overdue. Um, here I would like to use the opportunity to open the panel uh, and, and ask you to, to ask questions. And um, if, uh, if you have a question on your mind, please raise your arm and uh, tell us your name. And um, there is a microphone coming in the middle of the room. And if you need some time to think, uh, then uh, see, there goes the first question. Yeah, thank you. My name is Adolf Klokelesch. Uh, oh, I continue in English. My name is Adolf Klokelesch. I um, just would like to come back to this terminology of multilateralism and, and so forth. And I think we, we need to make good distinction between univer universal international organizations where more or less all countries are part of, and multilateral action that brings together a limited host of countries. And the problem we are facing now is that a limited number of countries is no longer willing to proceed on certain issues in broader coalitions. But we should not hide behind these facts that in bilateral cooperation, a lot can also be done, or in smaller coalitions. Take, for example, the cooperation with Europe and Brazil. Yeah. We, are, we are stuck in, in, in a cooperation that is detrimental to our nutrition and health in Europe and to the health of the environment in Brazil. We have a cooperation with Russia that is not geared toward carbon neutrality. We have no cooperation with Australia to move that cooperation beyond coal. So I think there is a lot of scope actually to engage in bilateral or maybe tri plurilateral uh, corporations to transform the patterns of economic interaction. I would like to, to hear voices from the panel. Do you want to go ahead? And, and... Yeah. Okay, th thank you very much for your comments and question. And uh, I think that uh, uh, my experience, my, I, I'm not a, uh, I'm an environmental analyst for the Minister of Environment and the former minister because I'm not a member of any political party, okay? And a good example, how uh, I, start my, I start my career doing, at the beginning of the new republic in Brazil, the new democracy in Brazil, okay? And uh, I fully agree that the diversity of ideas and opportunities that our combination uh, of efforts, you can address solutions. And bilateral cooperation plays play in the past in Brazil a strategic role uh, and still played strategic role, for example, between Brazil and Germany. Uh, before Paris Agreement alone, uh, Brazil uh, take, took a decision to have a strategy before Paris. It's a good example. And you have a bilateral agreement between Brazil and China Brazil and the United States with President Obama, President Obama, and also Brazil and Germany with Madame Merkel. If uh, Mr. Fabius mentioned the head of COP21, that when he read the terms of the framework of Brazil, the Brazil and Germany cooperation, it was there, all the concepts, everything that you need to address solution Paris Agreement. It was really interesting how we managed this considered bilateral common interest in the traditional bilateral cooperation to have a leapfrog for multilateral ambition to bring us together in such a way that we like to address not 20 Paris Agreement, but also the strategy beyond Paris Agreement. So my feeling is that we don't need to have a dispute, but we need to understand what are the common interests that multilateralism hosts and also that has the power to address solutions for all the countries around the world, or to bring more people on board. Uh, bilateral cooperation means that you can address solutions bilaterally, and you can influence other players, but you have to establish 
new arrangements for this. And multilateralism means that to host everybody, all the countries, to understand the diversity of situation and to address solutions, considering, as he mentioned, the international interest and be flexible how we can move on and how we can bring people together. So uh, I think that if, uh, we, if you are a country that really uh, highlight the importance of multilateralism, as Brazil used to do in the past, rec until recently, okay? And use your traditional bilateral cooperation to have co-benefits for multilateral agenda, that you can have a strategic approach, step by step, consider the time that you need to address some solution, the needs, and also how you can have outcomes at the global level. This is very interesting. It's a role that Alliance can support or can allow us to do and consider the new challenges of the new international world issues like the new the trade and for example climate change and the traceability, traceability, everything that we're discussing today consider for example land use. And also if you take a decision to bring social requirements or aging as you mentioned or migration or environmental displacement and put this everything together to address this we need multilateral multilateral process. So uh, for me, there is no dispute, okay, that uh, I do believe that uh, we can bring together, but to highlight the institutions, the international institutions' role, it's very important for countries like mine one to have some science for transition, exactly to show what would happen if you're not able to take decision uh, to avoid, uh, to postpone the agenda. It's not only the global science. For some countries, and bilateral can be very important to do, we need to address some issues, and scientific knowledge is very important, and also innovation is very important to make this faster. So uh, it's like uh, we are part of this planet, we are not part of the other planet. So I do believe in UN system, I do believe, <laughs> because it's my career, I have been working this the last 35 years, but bilaterally we need to understand what are the common interests that can go against what we'd like to promote. And by last example, Brazil, as I mentioned, has important energy mix based on renewable and non-renewable. Electric mix on renewable is around 85%. And now Brazil is taking a decision to have a bid based on coal and natural gas. You don't need this. This is a backslide. It's a good example that you need to avoid, for example, with international financing or the pressure that bilateral you can bring, saying this doesn't make sense for us. So I believe that you can bring everything together, but we need innovative approach, we need innovative player, multi-stakeholders, and we need innovative narratives to convince people because in the past, the credibility, for example, to address inequalities for developing economies, G77 plus China, this is completely in checkmate. And international cooperation is not only transfer, the transfer of funds, okay, in more than this. I've seen Manuel Rapnui uh, making some notes, so I'm sure he has something to add. Yes, a, f a few very concrete examples. I'm a policy planner, so what I said do not necessarily reflect the position of the government, but I'm still a, f a French diplomat. Uh, and so I very much support the idea of flexible formats. I think, uh, I think they're really important. They are one of the reasons why, for instance, we had the deal between the E3 plus 3 and Iran. It was the right format, it worked well, we had the deal. Still, those flexible formats work better if they can lean upon universal institutions which have different assets. And there wouldn't have been a deal on Iran uh, if uh, there was no uh, then uh, 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 leaning upon the UN Security Council resolution. Another point, uh, um, right now you have these uh, efforts to set up a dispute settlement body outside of WTO that would replace the one that is being hollowed out and do, do that without the US because the US uh, is the reason why uh, the WTO one uh, uh, will be blocked. So of course you can move without some of the players, including major players representing a major economy, a major trading uh, trade power as uh, the US. And I mentioned earlier that the Paris deal survived the fact that the US uh, withdrew. But you wouldn't, I, I, I'm pretty confident that you wouldn't, wouldn't have had a deal if before the deal you hadn't had this US-China agreement. So now that China is in, it's much harder for China to get out. But you wouldn't have had China in the deal if the US had not agreed with China uh, first. 
if, if you uh, want to set up multilateral rules of the road for the cyberspace, you can do it without the US, uh, Russia, China, Israel, uh, Iran, and North Korea. Of course you can. The problem is these are the most active uh, powers out there. So th this basically amounts to unilateral disarmament. Uh, and you have a number of countries in the world who are not really ready for unilateral disarmament, whether it's in cyberspace or in uh, uh, other issues. And more deeply, there is a reason why uh, um, Bilateral uh, uh, is not enough. Uh, you have this bilateral trade deal between the US and China. The reason why this is a problem is because this is only between the US and China. And so all of the problematic behavior by China elsewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia, in Europe, are not addressed. And if I was the US, I would think that goes against my interests that China can continue to behave the way it behaves elsewhere, and that my bilateral trade deal has only addressed bilateral issues. So the, the, the reason why we believe that the US uh, is wrong to uh, address uh, its trade dispute, its trade disagreements, its reproach for Chinese economic and trade behavior only through bilateral means is exactly the reason why we, meet, we must still make the effort to understand why there is added value for this multilateral level and why just the informal of smaller formats can be good, but are nearly not enough with compared to the kind of challenges that we are facing. Stéphane Dion. Yes. <coughs> uh, sir, thank you very much for your question. Let me uh, repeat it. Uh, you said um, uh, regional groups of countries don't want anymore uh, to work for universal purpose. My question is, when they were more willing than today, which, when, when is this golden age of universal uh, agreement in the world? Certainly not the Cold War. Today, it seems that some want to describe the Cold War as a quiet time of liberal order. It was a bloody ideological confrontation around the world. Uh, with wars everywhere, in Africa, everywhere. And, and at that time, the, the people and the decision makers didn't know that you would not end up with a major nuclear conflagration. They were every day with this fear that it may happen. So that was the, the Cold War. And since then, are you telling me that the 90s were better than today? The 90s with the Yugoslavian War, the Rwandan genocide, the war of Congo that made millions of people that were dying and nobody cared? I think it's better today. If it was that for the environment, I would be very, very optimistic. On the environment, I'm not. I'm sorry, the International Energy Agency are telling us we need to, to, to cap our global greenhouse gas emissions this year, in 2020, to decrease it by half for 2040, and to be carbon neutral for 2070. They are telling us to stop um, to expand coal. Well, coal is 40% of our electricity. It's 2 million megawatts. And we have planning in the world, or in construction, 500 megawatts more, 1,000 coal power plants, more than the 6,000 that are existing. <coughs> so I cannot be optimistic about the environment. But about our ability to uh, cope with peace, to try to decrease the number of conflicts and debt uh, by conflict in the world, to improve our ability to avoid pandemia, I think we have in our tools good, good, good ways to act, and uh, Canada will fight to, to develop it, to, to support it, and to believe in it. Are there any other questions? Yes, we take the two questions there together, and uh, actually, let's, let's actually collect, yes, and, and, and you then. Well, thank you very much. I'm Roger Fischer with uh, Germany's Development Cooperation Ministry. I already know that uh, Ambassador Dion is an optimist, so my question goes to the other two panelists. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just trying to put together what um, I think I have learned from this panel. On the one hand, uh, interdependence um, uh, will probably remain. It won't easily go away. 
On the other hand, I learned that uh, acceptance for the disciplines we need in order to manage these interdependence uh, isn't also easy to, easy to get within our societies. Um, Mr. Lafon Brabnui mentioned, I think with good reasons, uh, that uh, there, are, there is resistance against uh, these disciplines. So between the two, interdependence and resistance against discipline, something has to give. Are you looking at a future where interdependence breaks down? Or are we looking uh, at a future where uh, there is growing acceptance of uh, the needed disciplines? Thank you. Then there was a question uh, next to you. Right. Danke schön. Herr Botschafter, Exzellenz, ich habe eine wichtige Frage. Sie kommen aus Kanada und sind Botschafter hier in Europa. So, die Frage kann man so stellen. Welche Auswirkungen werden haben diese Brexit auf kanadische Wirtschaft bzw. in andere Form und weil Kanada gehört, wie ich schon wusste, zu Commonwealth, genau wie Australien, New Zealand und so. Zweite Frage ist, in Kanada ist äh, liberale Regierung, in Amerika ist konservative. Immer mehr äh, engagiert sich Amerikaner in Schutz der Europäer, das heißt hauptsächlich äh, für Polen und Pribaltika, das heißt diese, äh, diese Länder, die damals 45 Jahre unter der Herrschaft äh, Kommunisten gelitten haben. Dieses immer mehr Engagement, äh, hauptsächlich jetzt wurden die größten Manöver dort äh, abgehalten, ist das gut? Gut, was die Amerikaner machen oder wie beurteilen das? Und zweite Frage ist nicht an Sie, sondern auch Herr Französische Außenministerium, Herr Manuel Lafontia. Ja. Und wissen Sie, immer mehr ist Polen von der EU beobachtet worden wegen Rechtlichkeit, ne? wegen, weil es in welchem Gesetz angeführt und so. Wissen Sie, ich habe viel gesehen, dass dort die Regierung seit Monaten geprügelt, aber richtig, die Demonstranten. In Polen habe ich das nie gesehen. Warum? Die EU spricht nicht über Franzosen, aber nur über Polen. Dankeschön. Mhm. Dankeschön. Dann war hier noch eine Frage, die wir noch yes, einsammeln. I'll make it very brief. Um, what change... And, and, and can you just tell us your name? Oh, so. hi, I'm Rosa. Good evening. Um, what change are you expecting from the Alliance? Uh, and it's actually on the uh, topic of the discussion. And what are you expecting, you as international partners from Germany as host, and maybe even France as co-host? So this might refer to Brazil and Canada a bit more. And, and please, can you tell us again, what kind of change do we expect from multilateral cooperation? Do I understand? Mm -hmm. No, alliance. not from... Alliance. Yes. From the alliance, from the mm -hmm. concrete alliance that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Not from multilateralism as a whole, as a concept, yeah. but really from the alliance that initiates these initiatives. What, I, what, what change are you expecting or hoping from, for it? Thank you. So, um, then let's, let's start with uh, the question of uh, Mr. Fischer, interdependence, does it break down or um, does it move on to a new state? Oh, please. Oh, um, I don't think it will break down. Uh, even if decoupling, economic decoupling uh, or technological decoupling for that matter, uh, between um, the US and China was possible, and I'm not sure it is. Well, climate change is a good example of interdependence. Global pandemics are a good example of interdependence. Demographics are a good example of interdependence. Biodiversity, etc., etc. Um, so interdependence will not break down. It will be there uh, more and more, on the contrary, I believe. Um, uh, or if it breaks down, it means that we have reached a point in terms of our political and economic system, which uh, will be vet very, very worrying. Uh, and so, indeed, the question is about the acceptance of uh, 
not necessarily the discipline, but the, how, how do you foster international cooperation? Precisely, how do you understand that this is self-disciplining and not uh, discipline uh, just uh, uh, f for itself as mm -hmm. such? Uh, often people say, well, we'll have a crisis and then we'll see that we don't have a choice, which is more or less uh, what has happened, for instance, with the previous uh, SRAS pandemic that has forced a number of countries to change their attitude and which has forced uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization of the UN system, to uh, revise the way it actually deals with this issue. But there are a number of crises that you don't really want to wait for them because then it might be too late uh, or, or too uh, uh, terrible. Um, and so I think the, the one of the kids, it's why I've pointed to this uh, public attitude uh, issue for a number of times in my uh, intervention. There's a democratic issue. There's a democratic issue, which is you need to convince the people that this is the right thing to do. And you need to convince the people that not only the, the right thing to do, but there is no reason why they should actually relinquish control over our collective destiny to do it. Because it's not just about telling them, you don't have a choice, we have to do that at the global system. This is not going to work. What has happened with Brexit in the EU is exactly the illustration of the fact that people don't take it. They don't want just to be told, that's the thing you have to do, get, get a life and, and, and jump on board. Or actually, let us on board and we'll do it for you. So you need to deal with that democratic issue, and that will be the case more and more. And if the issues that multilateral organizations deal with uh, precisely are more and more about the people's daily lives, uh, trade, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, does your brother as a work in that factory uh, uh, on the neighboring town or not? Climate, uh, what happens to your uh, uncle who lives uh, near the sea? Um, uh, or pollution, what happens to your kid, etc. All, all these issues that we are dealing with at the multilateral level, they are not just issues of war and peace or very diplomatic and technocratic things that the people don't necessarily see as, as having a major impact on their day-to-day -day lives. This is there, all around us. So if we don't do that, don't do, uh, if we don't make that a democratic issue, we are not putting ourselves in the, in the best position to deal with this. I, uh, I agree, fully agree, considering the interdependence more than this. Uh, I think that uh, we need to use this new uh, political rooms exactly to connect the key issues that must be addressed, like climate change agenda showed to us, but uh, uh, we need to allow new narratives to bring people together. If you still continue discussing based on the trade-offs and the tracks in the past that uh, have this huge dispute, <coughs> and you need to understand, for example, what's the agreement between China and, uh, as you mentioned, uh, and uh, China and the United States, what it means, what are the implications, consider the bilateral interests, for example, like countries like Brazil. And, um, and uh, my feeling is that uh, we'll be fully interdependent, consider the disruptive technologies, for example. Okay, they're coming, changing, not on the digital ones, but artificial intelligence, uh, the Internet of Things, everything is, it really will change. And you need to understand how we manage this, considering uh, to bring the societies together. And uh, I hope that the alliance, I'm trying to answer because I don't have much time, uh, not only uh, facilitate to allow us to connect the issues uh, and uh, also to have these innovative narratives, but also please uh, try to understand the diversity of the players to have a common understanding of the problems, but the, the diversity of solutions, different tracks to address a, a common target or to understand better how developing and emerging economies need this transition. It's not easy to address uh, uh, countries like Brazil. It's probably easier than the other ones because we will hope still our population will be around 250 million people. But India, it's more than 1 billion people uh, uh, beyond 2030 or 2040. China, uh, really the African countries have really, uh, not only social inequality, have ecological inequalities. We're talking about lifestyles, we're talking about uh, the right to access, for example, water. Okay, and it's not only to access, how to use efficiently and how to have quality. It's diff really have uh, different uh, 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 
ways to address solutions and to convince people that we can do more. And the allies can be uh, a, a new political room to debate, as I mentioned before, not only uh, f uh, financial flows, as people would like to talk or to discuss this, but also how we can bring solutions and understand the realities that we need to face. Uh, uh, I'm convinced, and my last com comment probably our friend from Canada can uh, illustrate this better, that the alliance cannot go against the multilateral constituents that we have today, or try to facilitate, for example, what we have today, considering in climate change, the role of G77 plus China group, okay, or umbrella group, or where is this group, there's no island group. We need to understand the dynamic, dynamics of the negotiation that we have in the past, that we still have, and how we can bring these people together in new arrangements to implement Paris. Okay, but probably the dispute that you have in the past, it's, it's true, okay? Uh, the dispute not necessarily must co coexist consider the implementation process, okay? It's crazy. We are starting a new process to act. It's not based more on the traditional negotiation under an FCCC umbrella. This should be based on act, act, action. We need to have arrangements to facilitate how we can act. We need to have funds, but funds take care with something that uh, we need to, to build up trusty. It's like uh, sometimes uh, uh, people like to say because market has solutions and we invite private players. In the, but don't forget that around 10 years ago, uh, the global economy broke and market was fully responsible for this, okay? And so national society was responsible, national government was responsible to address solutions. We need to find the new ways to, to show that we must be together and we cannot go to replace the other players. We are looking forward to bring people together. Uh, I hope that, uh, I'm convinced that we can do this because we start a new game, okay? But if we start a new game based with the old players, I'm so sorry. It's like the uh, United States that's not part of the Biodiverse Convention and used to play against this <laughs> the last 25 years. So this is really doesn't make sense, okay? And uh, we need a pragmatic, we need to be really pragmatic to address solutions and to make clear for the society, what are the bottlenecks, the difficulties, the barriers that we have today. Don't use this uh, to play the game in the, the wrong direction because the civil society, the global society say, we are not support this anymore. And you have the populism in another, in another side of the coin that used to go against this to the Gansonism and they used to put the checkmate democracy. So for Brazil today, if you ask me, it's very important. We have two assets, to preserve Amazonia and to preserve our democracy. Thank you. Madam, you asked a question about the, um, uh, the, uh, in which way the new alliance may be useful. Canada believes in it. Uh, the way Minister Mas described it, uh, a network of countries trying to show that in working together on concrete problems, uh, they find solutions. And to give in confidence in multilateralism through that. Mm -hmm. I think there are two attitudes. The one that is to, to say, we have huge problems. It is the proof that multilateralism is in crisis and, and does not work. I think it's a mistake. The, the attitude we should have is, we have huge problems, and it's why we need to take care of our multilateral institutions and to work with them more than ever and to improve them. So the alliance, I think, is in the second uh, philosophy, and it's the right one. Uh, about Brexit and Canada, uh, well, Canada wants to stay friends with everyone. <laughs> With the EU and with the UK, uh, we have an international uh, free trade agreement with the EU. The UK is still part of it, and including for the coming year. And at the end of the day, we want to have strong relationship with the two. We hope that the fact that the UK is not part of the EU will not weaken our ability to have a strong Atlantic alliance, uh, because the UK is playing a strong role in it. Uh, so, uh, yes, it's good that uh, European countries are trying to uh, have a better coordination within the EU, but as long as it does not duplicate uh, NATO and we work uh, closely together, Canada, I think it's a, it's a good uh, idea. I would like to add a, an, an example about the fact that multilateralism is not the guilty uh, man. Um, we have a problem with climate change, but do you know that we spend humankind three and a half times more for military expenditures than everything we spend to address climate change. 
including clean technologies, clean energy, uh, uh, green transportation, uh, la land use, and so on, we spend much more on military expenditures than on climate change. It's not because of multilateralism. Mm -hmm. It's because we have the wrong priorities, and we need to address them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I, I think we've come to a conclusion here, and uh, if I look back at the different topics we have tackled um, under the, the big roof of multilateralism, it seems that we have both um, addressed the challenges multilateralism is facing, but we have also highlighted uh, how bilateralism and multilateralism can compete and also how in certain cases they can work together. And if I may also add an answer to, to your question about the alliance of uh, multilateralism and what kind of change it can bring about. I think um, when Donald Trump was elected and when Brexit happened, in two th or the, the decision for Brexit uh, was decided upon in, in 2016, we had a strong sense of pessimism spreading in Europe and, and all over the world. And I think how the world in the future will look like is also very much about projections and narratives. And uh, I think the Alliance for Multilateralism and getting together in this format will send a strong message that multilateralism is there to stay and there to prevail. And, and I think this is very important. Well, thank you very much for your interest. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. And thank you, Isabella Teixeira, Manuel Lafon rapnoui and Stéphane Dion for their brilliant contributions. Thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.